How much fuel do we burn when we fly around in a small aircraft? And how can we make sure we've put enough fuel in the tanks at our departure airport to arrive at our destination safely? Let's find out. Hi, I'm Grant and welcome to the fifth class in the flight planning series. Today we're gonna to be taking a look at the single engine piston and the multi-engine piston aircraft. In the previous class, we looked at a VFR flight plan with a generic aircraft. But for this class, we'll take a look at some of the details that can be found in the CAP 697 document for the SEP and the MEP aircraft, which is a bit more realistic to real life. You would look at your aircraft manuals to plan all the things like fuel burns, climb rates, descent rates, all that good stuff. So this is just a bit more realistic. Today, we are basically just gonna have a look at some of the graphs that are in the CAP 697 document and do a few examples so we can see how the graphs work. We're gonna start off with the SEP aircraft, which has these basic characteristics. Then we have a few graphs for the climb phase, cruise phase, and details on range and endurance. So let's jump into it and have a look at an example on the ATPL Airhead question bank, where we'll have to use uh, a graph from the SEP section. So this is the question I'm gonna use. Uh, so details, flight level 75, the outside air temperature is five degrees Celsius. During the climb, the average headwind component is 20 knots and it's takeoff from mean sea level with the initial mass of 3,650 pounds. And we need to find out the time and the fuel to climb. So if we then look at the graph, it's uh, 2.1 time, fuel and distance to climb. That's the one we need. So luckily for us that when we look at these graphs, there's always an example, uh, which will give us some clues about what to do. So it looks like in the example, they are climbing from a pressure altitude, at like a, an airport that's at 5,000 feet pressure altitude and a cruise pressure altitude of 11,500. So they're doing two and then taking the difference to find out the total fuel and climb between the two. We don't need to do that, luckily. In our question, we're climbing from mean sea level. Step one, five degrees Celsius, flight level seven, five. Five degrees Celsius about here. And seven, five is gonna be in between eight and six, slightly leaned more towards the eight. Uh, let's call it one, two. There's almost exactly five squares in between. So two and a half, about there. So a line about there, and then we draw it across until we reach the initial mass, which was 3650, which is this far line over here that curves down, something like that. And then we'll draw down all the way through to get the fuel and the distance and the time. Just like that, I've just really accentuated it there. So we can see that it would maybe take just under 10 minutes, maybe about nine minutes, nine and a half minutes, something like that. It's about three and a half gallons of fuel and the distance to climb is 20 or so miles, let's call it 19, just because I think I've drawn that a bit off. So something to note about these graphs is they don't factor in any wind at all. So this is when we're climbing with a true airspeed of 110 knots at all weights. So we know that we have a headwind of 20 knots, our ground speed would therefore be 90 knots. Headwind and tailwind components only act in the horizontal plane. So our vertical speed that we climb up to flight level 075 will be unaffected and it will remain at whatever it is to reach that altitude in nine and a half minutes. That's about 850 feet per minute or so, which is very reasonable. Our distance that we cover in the horizontal would be different though. Um, and we can figure out what that is by doing a very simple equation. I'll just jot it down on this uh, page here. So because the distance we cover will be proportional to the change, or pro proportional, sorry, to the difference between the true airspeed and the ground speed, we can just create a very simple equation, which is the nautical air miles over the nautical ground miles, if you like, equals the true airspeed over the uh, ground speed. So by plugging numbers into that, you get nautical air miles, we said it was about 19 over the nautical ground miles. That's what we would try and find out. 
equals 110 over 90. And when we solve that equation, we can find out that our nautical ground miles covered would be in the region of about 15, 15 and a half. Uh, so looking at the answers, I've clearly forgotten that we weren't even asked for the distance covered, but no worries, because you can now, now you know how to do it. Um, but the most um, close answer we have is probably uh, nine minutes to climb and 3.3 3, uh, gallons to do that climb. This is information that we could use in a journey log so we can accurately predict what fuel we expect to have left on board after our nine minute climb to the cruising altitude of flight level 075. If we noticed at the top of climb our fuel was five US gallon down instead of 3.3, then might, that might indicate that we have a fuel leak or some other problem and it might be worth returning to our departure aerodrome. It also might mean that uh, the temperature's hotter or um, what would it actually work? If the temperature's yeah, hotter, you're gonna burn a little bit more fuel and things like that. Okay, I'm not gonna go through every single graph in the CAP697 document because you're all grown up enough to figure out them on your own. Uh, I'm not gonna speed and feed you anything. So I've just picked out a few examples that we'll have a look at just to give you an idea. And then you obviously have to go away and do some practice questions. Um, you can go onto the ATPL uh, airhead website, I've got a link down below, get a 10% discount, uh, worth using, very good question bank, uh, which is where this example is from. So in this question, we're looking at endurance and this graph is pretty straightforward. We just go in with the information that is on the question. So the question says, we've got flight level 075, we've got 2300 RPM, and then we can find out our um, endurance from that. So from the question bank, we can see that this is quite a straightforward question, quite a straightforward um, graph to use. We just go in with the information of flight level 075, which is here about halfway. We can go over to 2300 RPM, which is this second line here. And then we go down to find our endurance, which is a line straight down. And we can see an endurance here of about 5.2 hours. We also have more information of 444 pounds of fuel on board, which is uh, what the associated conditions say. So that's here, initial fuel out 444 pounds. And this is, uh, Sometimes a bit of a red herring, you would call it, a bit of a diversion, a bit of a distraction. Sometimes this extra information can make you question yourself and question if you're doing it correct. So what you can do is just make sure you read these associated conditions because sometimes when they say 444 pounds of fuel is the initial fuel load, that's exactly what the graph is looking for. But there can be some graphs that have little corrections in them. So just if you see a little bit of extra information, you're thinking, what am I supposed to do with that? these little notes should help with that understanding. So our final answer doesn't need any corrections to it. We've got 5.2 hours. It's not five minutes and two minutes. It's 0.2 of an hour, 0.1 of an hour is six minutes. So five hours, 12 minutes would be our uh, most correct answer. And again, we could use that information for planning a flight in the single engine piston aircraft. We know we'd be able to fly safely to airports that are within 5.2 hours, because that'd be our maximum endurance. But uh, depending on the wind and things like that, we might not be able to make it. So we'd be a bit more conservative um, and you'd use that information to help you plan. So the multi-engine piston aircraft has these basic characteristics with the key addition of that second engine. The graphs aren't that much more complicated here. So as before, We'll just look at a few examples from the question bank with the first one being this question here. In this question, we're going to be using the cruise tables to calculate the cruise fuel burn and therefore the fuel that we will need to load at the gate or our block fuel. Our block fuel is made up of the taxi, trip, contingency, alternate, additional, final reserve and extra fuel. So we have some of those elements already given for us. So we've got taxi fuel of five, uh, a trip fuel of 
nothing because that's what we're trying to figure out. Contingency is 5%. Reserve is 30%, which will include the final reserve and the alternate fuel, I'm assuming, because our reserve, we want to be able to get to the alternate. It's not specifically broken it down. Um, cool. So the trip fuel is calculated at one degree and 65% with 2,500 RPM set. That means that we are looking at 65% power, 2,500 RPM, this line here, and we're gonna be looking at this column. And then at a flight level of 120, we're looking at this figure here, 30.7. But that is almost a bit of a misdirection because that is our manifold pressure, basically saying a power setting to aim for. Up at the top though, we can see our fuel flow, which is 23.3 gallons per hour. In the notes here at the top, you should be able to just see that on the screen. It says about correcting the manifold pressure. That's basically what the one degree part of the question is talking about. But we don't even need to bother with manifold pressure. We're just interested about the fuel flow per hour which is 23.3 gallons per hour. But again, an example of just what is that information for? Look at the notes and you should be able to figure out why they've given you that little extra bit of information. So 23.3 gallons per hour times two hours, 50 minutes, total for cruise, climbing and descending, which gives us 66 gallons of fuel. Contingency is 5% of this, as there are no special procedures in place to reduce the contingency to the 3% rule or anything like that. So 5% of 6 .6, uh, 66 is 3.3. Then our reserve fuel is 30%, making that 19.8. Add that all together and we get 94.1 US gallons. The closest answer here is 91, so we'll click that. Yep, that's right. And I'll click on the explanation here and see why it's different, so. Okay, the 30% reserve fuel must include the contingency fuel, but by adding it in, we wouldn't have actually done any harm, we'd have been safer, we've taken more fuel, and the answers are far enough apart in this uh, that there's no issue. One of the graphs that didn't feature in the SEP section was a descent graph. So in the MEP section there is, um, so we can now accurately calculate the information we need to plan for our descent. It's very similar to the climb graph, giving us fuel time and distance. So we're just gonna use this made up example for this one to show exactly how these graphs are so useful. So we've got to calculate the fuel time and distance covered in the descent by the multi-engine piston aircraft from 14,000 feet to 4,000 feet on an international standard atmosphere day with a 10 knot head wind. Okay, so let's have a look at the graph. Okay, so let's just draw some lines for 14,000 and 4,000 feet to start off with. It's an ice a day, so we just follow this line up. Once we've drawn the lines for 4,000 and 14,000, we then draw down to get the different values. And because there's gonna be quite a lot of lines here, just take your time and hopefully you won't go wrong. So I'll start off with maybe the distance and we'll calculate that nice and easy. So the first distance we can see is 40 and the next one is 10. We're wanting to find the difference, so 30 nautical miles, just like that, nice and easy. Uh, next one, we'll find out time, shall we? So for time, we've got a line here. So for time, we've got a line here and a line here. Again, we'll just take the difference between the two. So for time, we can see the values of 14 and four. So that means our time is gonna be 10 minutes. Almost there, next one we've got to do is the fuel burn. Again, very simple. We've got the first fuel burn. You can see the fuel line is very steep. That's because in the descent, you're normally going idle power. So you're not gonna burn that much fuel compared to the climb one. Uh, you had quite a, oh well, no, you didn't have a line, but you had, yeah, you would burn a lot more fuel in the climb than you would in the descent because descent, you use gravity. It's nice and easy. So let's say our first value is, so our first value is about five and our next value is maybe two, um, yeah, we'll call it that for three US gallons burnt. So there you go, there's our answer. Our distance of 30 nautical miles, our time of 10 minutes, and our fuel of 30 US gallons. But remember, there's no wind accounted for in that graph. So we're gonna have to use that trick that we learned right at the start, convert this from nautical 
nautical air miles into nautical ground miles. So nautical air miles over nautical ground miles equals the true air speed over the ground speed. The true air speed in this graph is 145 knots. So that means our nautical air miles of 30 over the nautical ground miles equals 145, 10 knot headwind, 135. Solve that and we get about 26 nautical miles. So in the descent, we'd go 26 nautical ground miles, well, nautical miles over the ground. It'd take us 10 minutes and we burn through three US gallons of fuel. And we'd again use that information in our journey log. We'd track it. We'd know how much fuel we need for that certain portion of the flight. That's it for the SEP and MEP graphs. They are fairly straightforward. You just need to pick out the information that's relevant. Look out for any adjustments, uh, such as, well, those notes really, and why you've been giving extra information. And remember the trick of adding in the wind for the climb and the descent graphs. I think that's pretty much it for the light aircraft uh, VFR section. So next we'll move on to some IFR flight planning and look at the bigger jets.